And we are now recording. <laughs> Welcome to Home Squat Home Struggles of 1970s, struggles, uh, housing struggles in 1970s Tower Hamlets, um, which is part of our Bangladesh 50 Years program, hosted by the Tower Hamlets Local History Library and Archives. Um, and this has been part of our uh, project uh, with the National Portrait Gallery called Citizen UK. Um, our program has been exploring uh, the connections between 1971 War of Independence and the local community here in the East End. Uh, for those of you who are completely new to us, um, we are a local repository of materials uh, relating to the uh, historic East End. Um, you can find out more about what we have in our collection. Please just visit ideastore.co.uk forward slash local history and you can find our online catalogue and upcoming events and all sorts there. So, um, as Sanjita mentioned, this is our last event, which, um, which is incredible. Uh, it's been a few months of incredible speakers um, and topics and, and wonderful participants. Um, and uh, though this is our last event, we have lots more happening in relation to Bangladesh 50 years. We have a few collaborations with Twanby Hall coming up. Um, and then uh, we still have, we have yet to unveil um, um, art installation commemorating uh, 50 years since Bangladesh Independence at Idea Store Whitechapel. Um, details of that will be available soon so please do follow us on our on our social media channels, keep up to date with us on our um, uh, newsletter and um, you will be able to find out more about that. So um, we have quite a tight schedule and so I'm going to move on to introducing our speaker today. I want to introduce um, Shabna Begum who we've had the pleasure of meeting when we when she embarked on her PhD at Queen Mary um, about a year and a half, two years ago now, I think. Um, you, and she's been using our collections amongst sort of many others. So we've gotten to know Shabna quite well over the last uh, two years and my colleagues love her. She's like the ideal researcher. <laughs> um, uh, so we've always, she's always a pleasure to have in the reading room. Um, so it's been really lovely also having her on our steering group uh, as part of Bangladesh 50 Years, where she's sort of helped us shape a lot of uh, the, the thoughts around this program, around the artwork, around uh, how we've been engaging with the wider community. Um, so Shabda um, is going to uh, present to us uh, for the first uh, 30 minutes or so, setting up the context for housing struggles in 1970s Tower Hamlets. Um, and then we will move on to introduce uh, Husnara Martin, who is an uh, activist at the time, who is one of the participants who uh, Shabna has been interviewing. Um, and she'll introduce her fully at that point. Um, I want to make a note here. This, the second portion of our event today will be in um, Bengali. Um, Shabna will be asking questions in, in Bengali and English, and then we will try our best between Shabna and I to paraphrase Husnara's responses. Um, this is so that, um, this is because we really wanted the session today to be anchored in sort of the experiences of people who were experiencing housing struggles in 1970s firsthand. Um, and so that we can um, ensure that Husnara is able to participate today. Uh, we will also be uh, paraphrasing uh, Husnara's responses in the chat box, so please bear with us, um, but we've dedicated a massive portion of the time to that, so you will be able to follow uh, everything. Um, so, uh, so I will move on to now uh, to Shabna's portion of the session. Um, and ask Shabna to share her screen. Okay, all right. So thank you, Halima, for that introduction. That was far more credit than I think I'm owed. Um, and I certainly don't know about being the kind of ideal um, research student dragging my kids sometimes into, into the reading rooms. But um, but yeah, thank you for inviting me and thank you to you and Sanjita um, for, for hosting us and um, for allowing us to have this kind of dual language event. And I'm so pleased to have Husnara Matin, who I will call Khala, which means kind of maternal aunt, um, during the course of this. She's not my maternal aunt, but it's just a term of reference that we, we, we use. So um, I'm really pleased to have um, Khala joining us for the second part of the session. 
Um, so uh, the title of my presentation is Home Spot Home, and uh, I have been doing my research on um, the housing struggles that um, Bengali people faced in the 1970s. So in terms of kind of my position and what the work that I've been doing, like Halima said, I'm based at Queen Mary. I'm um, within the School of Geography. Um, my supervisor, I've seen her photo pop up, so I know she's here in the audience as well. Um, and I've been looking at migrant home and homemaking in the context of the, the, the Bengali squatting movement. And so the research that I have been doing um, has involved archival research, which brought me into contact with Halima and the archives in Tower Hamlets. But I've also used archives at the London Metropolitan Archives, the British Film Institute, and also the George, George Padmore Institute based in Finsbury Park. Um, I've also um, been involved in doing participant observation, so I've based myself at two daycare centres, so older people's daycare centres in Tower Hamlets and used to spend a considerable amount of time there before kind of COVID restrictions, obviously. But the mainstay of my um, of my research was oral his history interviews, and I um, managed to find 39 participants um, who were either um, squatters themselves or who were squatter activists. And so, like Halima said, um, this research started a few years ago now, but actually it goes back much, much further. So the pictures on this slide are of my parents. So that's my dad in the top bubble. Um, and he's, my dad is on the right hand side, the shorter person. And that was him just before he arrived to um, the UK in 1963. And then the bottom picture is of my mum and my big sister and my grandma. And um, you can see in the background of that, stu of that um, shot, that was again taken just before my mum arrived and that was in 1975. Um, and you can see there's a ship in the background. Um, so that studio background is of a ship which links to some of the historical connections that I want to make with um, the, the, the research that I did. So really this story started a long while before this PhD. It started with the stories that my parents shared with me when, and my siblings when we were young. So in order to give some kind of historical context to what happened in the 1970s, there is that longer term historical context that needs to be referenced, which is uh, what a story that I think some of us are more or less familiar with, which is the kind of the, the relationship between the East India Company, the British Empire and Indian sailors or seamen often referred to as Lashkas, who kind of that connection between Calcutta and Sillet had that much longer hundred, you know, we're talking about hundreds of years worth of, of connection and history. Um, and we're, we're not talking about an insignificant number of people. Uh, I think in 1938, just over 25% of the British maritime kind of labor force was, was Indian seamen. So, um, so we're talking about a substantial number of people who had some connection to East London, had some connection to the docks in East London. And so there was that kind of familiarity that had been built up over, over uh, you know, a couple of hundred years at least. And so there's that longer connection that needs to be kind of highlighted. But then my research is also very much situated in the 1970s. And so in the 1970s, we had, um, so we've got a picture of Enoch Powell there, that kind of seminal speech in 1968, where the political discourse, and this is the kind of the, the, the state level mainstream political discourse had begun to divorce um, Britain from its empire. So, you know, we'd had the defeat of the British empire and um, Britain was beginning to reimagine itself in a different way and kind of severing those connections that it had. And in doing that was also kind of um, extinguishing the claims of those minority groups, those migrant networks that it had previously nourished and kind of invited, and kind of extinguishing their claims to the wealth that Britain had or the social resources that Britain had, and imagining itself very much as this white, bordered, sovereign state, um, and very much casting the, the, the migrant workforce that they previously invited as being kind of the other and being unwelcome. And so you had that state level racism that was very much part of the kind of mainstream political discourse. And you also had street level um, racism. So that photograph is a very photogra a famous photograph by Paul Trevor. And um, the, we had the street level racism where packy bashing was just a common term. You know, that was a, you, the, the kind of regular everyday violence that Bengali migrants experienced in the 1970s. Um, the, the, the state and street, you know, racism obviously interacted and uh, were kind of mutually reinforcing. And that was very much the kind of climate that we're talking about in the 1970s. 
and it's important to understand that because um, what happened in the 1970s, the 1971 Immigration Act meant that previously you'd had migrant men who had come over mainly. There, there were some families, but they were the very kind of small minority. Previously, Bengali migrant men had come over and they had very much behaved as transnational commuters, that they would come work for several years, go back home, go and see their families, take a few months out and then return, all based on this kind of remittance economy. But with that shift in the political kind of discourse, the 1971 Immigration Act also changed the nature of a uh, kind of um, commuting between um, Bangladesh and Britain and um, it meant that the Bengali migrant men who previously had been able to come back, backwards and forwards felt that they needed to make a choice they needed to make a choice about what kind of you know either possibly face the the situation where they might be separated from their families and so the 1970s context is important because that's a point where lots of um, Bengali families began to arrive so men were joined by their wives their children and this created that housing crisis that, uh, that kind of developed into the, um, the, the squatter movement that I'll go on to talk about. Um, and the 1970s is also important. And the reason why I was invited to speak is because I do think that the, the, the 1971 war, the liberation struggle was also a really important factor in how um, Bengali migrants viewed um, both the kind of oppression, they, the, the kind of parallels that they um, uh, uh, kind of made between their experience of exploitation, inequality and justice here, and that which had been experienced in the, in the liberation struggle in 1971 and, and in the run up to that as well. And so I talk about the political inheritance of the 1971 war in terms of the activism, particularly for the younger men, that they went on to kind of um, uh, to activate in, in, in the context of 1970s racism. So that link between Silet and Spitalfields is a really important one. And the 1970s was um, also um, uh, very, um, squatting in the 1970s was also quite common. So um, it wasn't a criminal act at the time. And these photos are from David Hoffman, who was a famous squatter photographer, um, who um, lived and squatted in Fieldgate Street. Um, and with these are pictures that he's taken some really kind of insightful photos of squatter communities um, in 1970s in Tower Hamlets. And he was really generous with his photographs. And th this is not just in Tower Hamlets. I think that the numbers are kind of, uh, it's really difficult to know numbers because squatting was often done, done illicitly. But I think that people have said that there were about 30,000 squatters just in London alone. And um, squatter communities in Tower Hamlets, in Brixton, in Camden, um, in Wanstead, in Redbridge. So, you know, all over London. And he was really generous with his photographs because he's, his photographs do show lots of Bengali um, uh, families as well in lots of the street photogra uh, photography shots that he's taken. And um, I asked him about, would you, you know, would, would you be able to trace any of these people? Have you got any of their names or contact details? And obviously this was you know 40 odd years ago um but he was he, he was really honest and said i you know we we were moving out as the, this group arrived in and we i have these photographs but i don't know any of these people and that for me was where my research came in because it was very much that that we kind of on the periphery know that bengali squatters were there they existed there's an excellent academic account, which I hope that um, Halima or Sanjeev might share in the chat box. Um, Sarah Glynn, who was one of the participants on the, in this programme of events, um, she, she's done some work on Bengali squatters, but she, uh, she looks at it from a very different angle. And she looks at class, ethnicity and religion in the East End. And she's written a, a really good account of Bengali squatters. And so has Charlie Foreman, someone, someone else who was uh, kind of, who arrived in Tower Hamlets a little bit later. But my research was very much about trying to get the experience of Bengali squatters from the actual participants. And I think that's what was absent from all the other accounts, the, the kind of popular and academic accounts, as well as these photographs, is that Bengali squatters are peripherally there, but you, you, we didn't really hear about them or, or certainly the, the experiences from their perspective. So um, I'm just going to ask Halima to play a short clip of um, uh, one of the archival materials that I came across, it's at the British Film Institute and the link will be shared in the chat as well so you can watch the whole thing, but just to give you a sense of kind of what was happening at the time and how people felt. So I think Halim's just gonna, uh, should I stop sharing Halima so you can play that? Yeah, I'm just gonna go ahead and see if it comes okay. up. Okay. Yes.
Disculpa. Sorry, I'm going to stop sharing for a second. Just okay. because it's playing up. Hang on one sec. Okay, I'll try that again. If it doesn't work, Halima, that's fine. Or oh, maybe you can see if you it's can working. get it. Just one. You know, I try to come back home. In the 1930s, Jews were victimized and attacked in the East End of London. In the late 1970s, it was the Bengali community who became the target for racial attack. So now is our people, the is dark. They're scared to come out on the street. What happened to you? Well. I was uh, been to Hackney, it's my friend party. I was come back to home, you know, I tried to come back home. And this time there was attack me about uh, 25 people. I was only six members. There mm -hmm. were attacks. With there were six of you and yeah. 25 people attacked you? Yeah. So the starting fight uh, by bottle and stone to get the everything. We don't have anything. You know. My brother, sister, father and mother, they literally, you know, they want to play some time, uh, going outside, while some English kid coming to hate them, you know. So they're coming back to house and crying, this and that, you know. There aren't many Bengali families living on the newer and predominantly white estates outside Spitalfields, like this one in nearby Poplar. Those that do live there are an easy target for racist attacks. I didn't see that. Anyway, young stop, no, not more or less than 16, 14 years old. But these are white. Why do they pick on you? Because uh, I'm Asian this way. At night, about half past 10, uh, we are sitting down here and they throw the big stone, that one. And when it's come in, in to the windows, and it's nearly hit my son. Same time, just 15 minutes before, they throw the big, big, big stone. My one-year-old boy was on sleep on the bed, and some glass go over his head, but in, in his heart. I reported the police. Policeman comes with me and they, they just write down my statement. Yes, we are feeling very, you know, very bad. We, we want to move from here. Because my children is too much fried at night. We want to immediately move from this house. In Spitalfields itself, the buildings may be old, but they are safe. Over 60% of the residents of Spitalfields are Bengali, often forced to live in the worst accommodation, considered uninhabitable by their white neighbours. The white people that are left are all the old Jewish people. Um, we can, we can, we can yeah, do the best. Yeah. But as the flat's going... Thank you. Um, thank you. So let me get back.
Okay, so so that that thank you, Halima, for showing that. So that's a clip taken from this series, and actually, it's uh, they're they're available on the British Film Institute archives, and you can watch them online for free. And there's a series of three of um, three episodes, and it that kind of demonstrates um, what what was specific about the Bengali community and their housing struggle, which was uh, twofold, really. So first of all, lots of Bengali migrants found it very difficult to obtain social housing. And this was because of the kind of institutional discrimination that they faced in the sense that um, you had um, the, the housing waiting list, which were neutral and fair, uh, uh, meant that you had to have been resident in London for five years. And then the, the, the last year of that had to be continuous residence, uh, in, uh, uh, continuous residency in Tower Hamlets. And so for lots of men um, who were who had often been um, kind of resident in Tower Hamlets and London for, you know, more than a decade in some instances, um, they would have gone home in order to go and apply for their families to, to, to be able to come here. There were lots of, there was lots of bureaucracy at the time, in to, and there is even more so now, but um, lots of bureaucracy involved in terms of trying to apply and get the families over. And so that short period of having been out of the country meant that lots of Bengali migrant men then were disqualified from applying for social housing. So that institutional kind of um, uh, discrimination against the, the Bengali migrant community meant that they found it very difficult to even apply to be on the housing waiting list. You also had that racist street violence. So um, the, the clip showed there and that was such a regular occurrence um, for so many Bengali migrants and so many of our parents and grandparents generation, that kind of street violence, which was kind of, you know, met you in your home because you, you, your, your windows were regularly broken. and so. Um, lots of Bengali migrants felt very um, unsafe and vulnerable when they did manage to get social housing or council flat and they were housed, in this instance he talked about Poplar because Poplar was considered a no-go area at the time for the Bengali um, community. So they faced that kind of the institutional discrimination, the street kind of discrimination as well. And they found themselves living often in the, the worst housing and what Charlie Foreman described in his book or, you know, he referenced Charles Booth and where that kind of the, the, the quality, the, the, the state of those flats that Bengali people were living in was considered unfit for the working class in the 19th century. And we're talking about Bengali people living, living in those uh, spaces in the 1970s. And so this is what kind of triggered Bengali squatters, um, Bengali families to begin to squat. So they began to squat because they saw that there were white communities and white people who were going in opening up houses and squatting and inspired by that and their own unique set of circumstances in terms of this kind of discrimination they began to squat and the turning point came when um, you had the involvement of the Race Today Collective. So the Race Today Collective were a group of black power activists, um, uh, Mala Sen, who was Calcutta Bengali for Dondi, and Darkus Howe were kind of prominent activists as part of the Race Today Collective. And they saw, they kind of were a, an organisation which tried to tap into grassroots movements and they saw what was happening in Tower Hamlets and that Bengalis had begun squatting and they saw this as a, a potential kind of um, a struggle that they wanted to get involved with. And so the Race Today Collective got involved. But also, and uh, I'll come on to talk about Terry Fitzpatrick in, uh, in, in a bit more length uh, in, in, in a few slides time, but the, the Terry Fitzpatrick was one of the white squatters who really got involved with the Bengali community. He was um, someone who the Race Today Collective identified as a bridge into the community. He'd already kind of um, had some connection and made some relationships with Bengali families. And so those non-Bengali activists came in and um, it was in 1970. Six. And so my parents were, were here, literally around the corner from where this meeting took place in the Montefiore Centre. And there was a, a big meeting with lots of people who had individually been squatting, lots of families who'd been squatting. And there was a big meeting of about 70 different um, uh, individuals at the Montefiore Centre in 1976, where they talked about formalising an organisation and trying to kind of create a bit, a bit more of a kind of um, a co a co a coordinated network between um, different squatter families, individuals and loose-knit groups as well. 
And they came up with the Bengali Housing Action Group, which is a lovely acronym, BAG, so BAG means to tiger and, and to share. And so both of those were really beautifully kind of apt for, for what was going on because it was this kind of radical movement and also about kind of have it, having a share of the social resources that the community felt entitled to. And at that meeting, um, uh, they uh, spied a building, uh, a tenement which was and no longer exists, but called Pelham Buildings. And um, they, um, a Terry who spotted the building decided that that was going to be their next target. And that was, um, they, they, you know, went over and within a few weeks, all 72 dwellings, so there'd been a few people left, it mainly been decanted by the council, but all 72 of those dwellings were taken over. So 72 flats were taken over, it became Bugs Fortress and Terry himself moved in there as well. And that, for the, those, those families lived there for about a year and a half before they began to be kind of rehoused. So the, the Race Today Collective were really, really important. And this map kind of gives you a sense of where the Bengali squatter communities were. And, um, uh, the, 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 you know, this is where most of the participants that I spoke to were situated within these pockets and these areas. And that um, uh, little article on the right kind of references to the fact that squatting was not just about achieving a house and a home for the individual, the family. It was also very much about creating a safe space for the wider community and that the, the need to feel um, kind of secure um, was a, 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 another kind of angle of being at home in a particular space so um so those were the kind of areas but it stretched beyond that as well um, but those are the kind of areas that my, the participants that I spoke to. So you can see the Spitalfields area and then behind the um, East London Mosque and um, behind the Royal London Hospital, big pockets of, of squatter communities. And so we get on to Terry Fitzpatrick and it seems odd to start Bengali squatters with um, uh, uh, a white um, person, but um, uh, Terry Fitzpatrick, you can't talk about the Bengali squatters movement without referencing Terry. So Terry um, is not an East Londoner by birth. He um, is of Irish background and was originally, um, you know, was from Liverpool. And um, he came to London in 1974, he came to um, uh, East London in 1974, and he began squatting in Aston Street near Stepney. And um, he was a builder by trade. And so he, you know, he knew his way around a house and how to kind of access houses and how to fix them up as well. And he and a group of other people who, who he wasn't necessarily connected to were squatting and Bengali people came to learn of this white kind of um, uh, the, the, the white squat in this particular area and came to them for support and Terry became the the, the linchpin uh, he he was the person who um, provided practical support for um, lots of these you know hundreds of families I, I, I think out of all the participants that I spoke to every single person um, knew about Terry or had been aided by Terry directly and so he was a really important um, person within the Bengali squatters movement and like I said he also um, moved into Pelham Buildings. So he actually moved into Pelham Buildings. He actually speaks proper, probably better Bengali than me. Um, and he's been to Bangladesh several times now as well. And so, and he's retained lots of those um, connections with people who squatted. And he was um, critical to my research in terms of kind of, you know, um, sourcing people and finding people to, to speak to. So Terry was really important and his, his picture there with his partner, Claire Murphy, who was also important in different ways. So she wasn't involved in the squatting, but she was a youth worker at the time. And lots of the younger participants that I spoke to um, um, spoke about Claire and the, the role that she had in their in their lives as well. So, so Terry Fitzpatrick was uh, really important. And like I said, race today were able to kind of get into the Bengali community because of Terry. Um, but there are lots of other Bengali squatters that we've also not heard about and, you know, their stories have never been told. So Abdul Qadir here. And again, I'm really conscious. Of, I did invite people, the participants to be part of this audience. So I'm, I'm, I'm going to be talking about people whose families and uh, who may well be in the, in the audience as well. So please do kind of come back in the chat and the question and answer session if you'd like to contribute more or if you want to fix something that I might have said. Um, but Abdul Qadir here is featured on the left with when he featured in that actual documentary. So he's in the documentary where he talks about he and his family being kind of squatting and arriving at squatting because 
he'd been here at the time, I think Abdul Qadir um, arrived in 1957 actually, so he'd been here for a long time um, uh, before his family came over in 1975. And uh, his dad had worked on English ships and sailed the world. He didn't even really know his, his dad um, because his dad spent so much time on working abroad and on these English ships. But he'd arrived in 1957. He would brought his family over in 1975. And in the documentary, he talks about having applied for housing, having kind of repeatedly gone to the housing officer um, and kind of, you know, really kind of um, uh, uh, pleading the case for the, an urgency of the need to, to get some better housing for him and his, his family and his young children at the time. And that that just didn't happen. They just were ignored. He felt that the, you know, Bengali, uh, uh, that Bengali people like himself were, were just ignored. And so he says that he squatted because he, ha you know, he, he had no other option. And so Abdul Qadir is featured there now. He still remains in Tower Hamlets. Um, and he talked about when he squatted. So he squatted, first of all, having been initiated into squatting by Terry. Um, but then that accommodation wasn't great. And so he left that squat. And then he talked about returning to squatting at a different time and squatting in Wheeler, Wheeler House. And that was kind of toward the later 1970s. And he described how he'd spotted a vacant flat and um, kind of he knew that he had to kind of move in pretty much straight away. And so he uh, had raced back to the flat that he was at, that he and his wife and his children were in. And he'd grabbed a mattress because that was a custom. And he grabbed a mattress, raced it across Petticoat Lane Market and literally got, went and kind of flung it inside the flat and then brought his wife and uh, his children over. And then he recalls the the that within a few hours, I think, I think it may be even less, I think kind of pretty much immediately, the, the neighbourhood boys had gathered outside the flat and then that the, the whole flat was pelted with rocks and stones and every single window in the, in the house, like the, the, the clip showed, was broken by these boys who were shouting obviously racist abuse as well. And he, he talked about racing outside with um, a da, which is um, kind of a floor-based kitchen knife and kind of threatening the boys and, and them running off. And um, there were so many times I asked my participants that, were you not scared? That sounds really scary. And their response was, what, what are you going to do? What, what are you going to do by being scared? We had to, you know, we, we had no other choice. And Abdul Qadir didn't just squat himself and his family. He went on to help. So several other families arrived to squat on that same estate. And he supported those families. He supported those families both by kind of just being there, but also in trying to organise them into a loose organisation where they wrote letters as a collective in order to kind of um, uh, persuade the council to, to give them the tenancies. And so his activity wasn't just based uh, in terms of kind of uh, securing his own housing. It was a much wider um, contribution to the squatter community. And just to relate back to 1971 war, he, he, he told me some amazing stories. And this was just in passing. You know, this is the, the, the kind of beauty of doing oral history interviews that all sorts of things come up. And he told, told me about during the, the, the 1971 war, how he and his friends had been part of the demonstrations but that they'd also uh, organize these massive collections and at the time they couldn't send the money um, back home and so he and his friends had actually chartered a plane now I can't imagine doing something like that now but chartered a plane and I think they arrived in Burma first and because they couldn't get straight into Pakistan as it was then they went from Burma and then got into India in order to make sure that the money that they'd collected here could be given to the kind of the 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 Mukti Bahini, the, the the soldiers who are fighting as part of the liberation struggle, and these are the kind of amazing stories. So the kind of he was active here in so many different ways, and these are the kind of forgotten um, uh, stories um, that we you know are in danger of losing. But he his it was a really significant story. Um, and moving on to this other person who um, who's called Muhammad Ghulam Yahya, but who I know as Fossil Sessor, who um, is featured there um, on in the kind of black and white photo. He's the guy holding Mala Sen's arm. He was known as a Bengali giant, and that's not just because of his size. I think he he, he kind of is six foot something or other, um, but he was also one of the first and earliest squatters that I spoke to. So he squatted in 1970 
Um, he'd arrived here in 1967 as a 21-year-old um, uh, man and he had worked in various different restaurants and then gone on to kind of do some tailoring work. And he recalled how he began to squat and he said that he used to kind of be, he, he was carrying around bags of clothes and possessions and someone, one of his white colleagues had said to him, what, what are you doing? Why do you always carry all so much stuff around with you? And he'd explained that, you know, the, the way that they lived at the time was that you had multiple occupancy shared beds, triple shift beds, um, and that, you know, if someone else came and they, they needed your place and you had to move on. And so he'd explained that to his white colleague and his white colleague was obviously kind of, you know, horrified at, at the, how he'd been living and said, well, you know, let's, I'll show you how to squat. And uh, Khosrow Sata had never heard of squatting before, but he was well up for it. And um, he just, he went along with this person and the person showed him how to um, enter the property to change the locks, what to say if anyone came along. And that turned out to be Khosrow Sata's um, uh, flat for, for a, good, a good number of years. So he squatted there um, for, for a long while, but that introduction and someone else helping him, he paid that on many times over. So he, he, he said that he, he squatted hundreds of families over that next decade. And um, he wasn't just involved in squatting um, families, he was involved. So that, is, that picture is um, from 1976, and that's one of the first anti-racist demonstrations. And he was also involved in um, a kind of the, the early kind of anti-racist mobilization that happened. And he, along with Terry, so he and Terry knew each other, they were good friends. And um, they were involved in vigilante patrols. And so one of the things that lots of squatter activists like Khosrow Sasa did was that not only did they squat individual properties and help families in and open up those houses, um, lots of those squatter activists recognised that actually what um, the, the kind of street racism that people face, the vulnerability that lots of these migrant um, uh, men felt was something that they wanted to be able to contribute to. And so he was involved in lots of vigilante patrols with Terry, I think there was a Ford Zafira that they talked about, maybe not a Zafira, maybe that sounds too modern, but anyway, it was a Ford of some kind. And they would go out patrolling the area just to have a visibility to kind of make sure that the kind of the, the skinheads, the, the, the kind of racist violence couldn't just go and um, be something that people could just um, kind of um, uh, enact on people without any um, kind of fear of, of retaliation. And so um, Khosrow Sasa was very much part of the wider vigilante patrols and he was known as a Bengali giant, I think, because he, he was quite physical on lots of occasions. So, um, but he, he, he was part of the, the wider squatter activism as well that stemmed beyond just squatting properties and being part of the, the kind of vigilante um, uh, action that took place as well. And then we've got here Sophia Begum, who is Abdul Qadir's wife. And um, like lots of um, the squatter families, uh, one of the things that I think was really important was that the men folk of the families would often be out working very long hours in the factories and tailoring. And it was the women who were at home who um, were the what I described as the kind of the guardians of the squat because they were the ones who faced the racist violence, whether it was coming through their windows or through their letterboxes, whether it was the council estate officer who was knocking at the door and um, kind of demanding that people leave and vacate. It was the women who were at home who faced and confronted those conversations and that and that hostility. But um, I, I picked Sophia Begum because apart from, uh, from all of that, um, she was also involved in the East End Community School. So on the right hand side there, you've got a picture of the East End Community School. And at the back, you can see Nurul Hock and he and his wife were both squatters in Pelham buildings. And they also squatted and started this East End Community School. And again, this goes back to the Liberation War because Nurul Hock was one of the older people during this time. He had been involved in the language struggles when he had been in Bangladesh before kind of in the run up to the 1971 war. And you can see that commitment to kind of the Bengali language in that in 1976, 
he and his wife went and squatted um, a, a basement flat just off Gorston Street and they set up the East End Community School and it was entirely voluntarily run he and his wife were the teachers there and they recruited um, children from the local area and they were really committed to ensuring that Bengali children could nurture their their linguistic heritage and that again I think links back to the the, the civil war and the, the the language movement that was part of it and Sophia's role was really important in that because she talked about that people were really worried understandably this was a school that operated after after kind of you know you'd been at day school and so people were worried about sending their children out in the evenings to go to this school because of the racist violence but also it was a it was a a, a, a grossy building by all accounts it wasn't a particularly nice building and people were worried about the the kind of dilapidated nature of the of the school and Sophia talked you know really passionately about how important it was that children remained connected to their Bengali language and that she sent her children there but she also actively encouraged other other people to go and uh, to, to send their children as well and that was really important I think and that East End Community School has lived on so that that legacy eventually kind of um, uh, it was it, it faced eviction several times and Nora Hock was actually arrested at one point um, and the community went and, and, and got him out and he, he faced court action but uh, you know, so the, the story of the East End Community School and the story of mothers who were sending their children, uh, again, are the kind of stories that we, we, we haven't heard. And then how did this come to a, a conclusion? So it didn't really, some of the participants that I spoke to spotted well into their 1980s. So it didn't come to a nice, neat conclusion. But there was in 1977, again, another turning point where the GLC, who owned a, a large amount of the housing stock in Tower Hamlets and across L London, um, had by this stage, they, they just couldn't co cope with the number of squatters and the kind of the, the litigation and the bureaucracy of trying to evict them was, was just too, too much for them. So, um, that and a change in the kind of uh, the, the the politics of the GLC meant that they announced a squatter amnesty and that meant that anyone who registered within a month of that date um, was entitled to secure a tenancy either in the property they were in or um, would be rehoused so it was essentially where the council and uh, this is why I think it's a, a kind of a, a semi victory because the council was accepting that it had an obligation and a duty to house these people and whereas previously it had kind of shirked that responsibility and so like I say it was by no means a, a nice neat conclusion to the story lots of people continue to squat for a long time afterwards but for lots of my participants um, that this was the turning point where they secured a, a legitimate tenancy and became tenants could pay rent and therefore be entitled to some of the kind of um, the, um, uh, the the privileges that come with tenancy. So um, so that was really the turning point. And in terms of my research, I kind of uh, I'm going to bring this to a conclusion because I know um, uh, I really want to bring in Hala at this point. Um, in terms of my research, I really wanted to argue three points, and this is the argument that I've been making, which is that the Bengali migrant squatted home was a site of political contestation, that it was significant. And um, a, a lot of that significance has been erased from kind of squatter histories because it kind of felt like, oh, Bengali people were deprived, they, they had no option but to squat, and so therefore, you know, there's no real significance to what they were doing. And my argument is very much that the, the, the context of state and street racism that people experienced made any person who was in that situation opening up a squat, taking, occupying that house or flat, um, that was political. And it don't, you don't need to have kind of highly intellectualized theoretical arguments that you're making in order to be political. Some people did. Some people did make those arguments as well. It's not to say that they didn't, but that, you know, what we consider political, I think, has to be more generously defined. Um, the, th the second argument I make is that that squatter activism really spilled out into that wider vigilantism and then led on to some of the anti-racist mobilizations that gathered pace in the 1978 period onwards. And again, I think that's really important because I don't think that the 1978, the Al-Qab demonstrations that happened, they didn't happen from nowhere. They happened because there had been this level of organization that was beginning to kind of feed into this sense that this is wrong and we as a community can, can do something about it. And I think that the, the squatter activism was um, critical to that, that the latent mobilizations. 
And then the third argument that I make is that the, the transnational connections are really important, that there was a political inheritance that particularly the young male migrants um, kind of brought with them, that they had seen or experienced the, the Bangladesh civil war, they had witnessed that level of kind of exploitation, inequality, injustice, and they brought that resistance here to the experiences of racism in 1970s London. And so that kind of transnational political inheritance is something that was really important. But also there was a bit of the reverse as well. In many ways, some of the older men um, kind of took their affection for what happened that the liberation struggle, the, the birth of Bangladesh, an infant country at the time, they saw the squat as an opportunity to be quite temporary and transiently here and then to return back home. So for them, that political inheritance was that they wanted to go back home. They wanted to go back home and to kind of rebuild uh, or re uh, build anew the, um, Bangladesh. So that, that transnational connection is also really important to the squatter activism here. So um, I, I'm happy to have some questions based about my research, but I think actually one of the things that I felt really committed to was that this is not, well, it kind of is indirectly my story. My parents were there. I was born um, in, in Tower Hamlets in 1976. So it indirectly is my story, but I also wanted to make sure that the people who's, um, who lived it um, were able to tell their stories as well. So you have to forgive me. My parents always told me to speak Bengali in the house and I was one of seven siblings. Most of them, uh, I think, are on this um, on this call. And so when you've got seven siblings and your parents tell me to speak in Bengali, you just don't listen. You just speak English because it's easier. So I regret that now. So my Bengali isn't great, but I'm going to attempt to kind of talk to um, Husna Khala um, and um, uh, just chat about some of her experiences. And Halima said that she's going to paraphrase into the chat box so you can follow if you don't don't speak Bengali and I'll try and paraphrase once um, uh, Khala has finished her responses as well. So I'm just going to ask Khala to unmute. Uh, should I stop share as well? Yes. Is yeah. Just, yeah. yeah. Please. So let me get rid of that and Khala if you, um, I'm just going to choose you. Okay. Okay. Oh, so, so Khala, um, yeah. so I'm spoiler. Um, so Husna Matin is um, uh, someone who lives still in the place that she squatted um, from 1974. So Pakistan, I'm not so dear. I was some ten sorry, I'll be Pakistan. I see a rehash for a good to lack. The Juduma Jamio Hana, Pakistan at Kaslam. There see Judutam that the Kerona, Huntam over here night at all Gufon, Ovistagija over here. Are all two horses in the Bachana Slam at Pinjan Sukasuko, by Chandra Loya Jamra Hotte, Escata Slamani Amra, Ola Doraidam, the Kulsu Amra Kita Horbo, Amra Janina Amra. Pakistan Razdani Islam Islamabad, Islam Islamabad Islam. Pakistan ko Pakistan aur Razdani Islamabad to Islamabad to chhoto lag. Samra Bangladesh Pakistan aur Razdani Islam Islamabad. To hum shogal jo official jaira hamda rokdar ajbent. Firat ko ro aibani na niye reshoriya ni bani kito hi hamra kitu jani na Allah ke doror ma shob shob ma doror ma je taqsa mar khaliya usme hamra radio radio kitu hum tambar tamna. খারাপ <laughs> Bondio na bondi, mane kichu na dunyar ko orjan yar na olaki. Kuch bishomay kur foristiti to jawan jata wo hai, jawan kuta jawan bilja kujai tambar na kito. Jawan gustam barsi jamra khoto khosto khoto jo aramra desh kita aur aramra desh ron ni kita aur kitiyo. Udo ta khoto aramra fasma shono khosto hori sahar hori mane kitiyo hori hori aramra icha hori ya abar sudiyar ko kisi ke umra bishalu ya. Tarar ko isi amra amra umra jeta kisu tarar manusho bala asil Pakistan aur manush amra help korte shayi to korte amra yar photo bata yar. Wo kurasi ta isi amra bishal hoyta umra bisha amar toh na amar husband ni se gear restoria hoyte India 
do la lota e teje de se na pluto ho ta por universidade ta ho se na ta na amar manus ta var sar se to amar so diaro va var gesi so diaro gelam gi pasma shore aki pagya manus jai ra so bishom ei pakistan joto bangali asan je je va afganistan ya ki ta kabul ya manus fesho aro ya khali baroi ra je ge unjat jai ra je je no barra baroi ra jai ta amra abar so diaro tai gesi to ekta jitwa sil so diaro bai আবার পরে আমরা এখন তো একটু পেশাই সৌদি আরব কিতা হয়েছে আবার এমবেসিত লোকাল তারা রাখছে তারা তো মনে করে আমরা তারার মানুষ আমরা তো বিত্র বিত্র আমরা তো তারার রই না তো আমরা আরো নয় মাস থাকতে থাকে যে সৌদি আরব জিদ্দাত স্বাধীন হইছে দেশ দেশ স্বাধীন হওয়ার পরে জিদ্দাত যাওয়ার পরে একটু আমরা যেমন নিউজ শুনতাম পারছি এই যে বিবিসি নিউজ বাংলা নিউজ হইতো বিবিসি টাইপ কি হইতো মানে নিউজ শুনছি কিন্তু ফার্স্ট মাস পাকিস্তান আমরা খুব সাবার হচ্ছে খুব কষ্ট করছি তারপরে দেশ স্বাধীন হয়েছে স্বাধীন হওয়ার পরে নয় মাস যুদ্ধ হওয়ার পরে নয় মাস আমরা এইন টাকার বাইরে দেশ স্বাধীন হওয়ার পরে তো আমরা এমবিসি টা রাখছে না বার করে পিলাইছে যে বাঙালি যত সতেরোটা ফ্যামিলি আসলা ডাক্তার ইঞ্জিনিয়ার স্টাফ সহ তারপরে আমরা হই যেতাম এখন আমরা গড়ো নাই কাটরো নাই মানে সৌদিও আমরা কষেন না পাকিস্তানে বোঝাও আমরা আমরা খুব সাফার করিয়া ইন্ডিয়ার করিয়া তো ইন্ডিয়ায় জাহাজ দিছে হোক যাত্রী লোক হল লাগি আর ও জাহাজ আমরা রে সতেরোটা ফ্যামিলি রে আমরা রে টিকেট দিছে ফার্স্ট ক্লাসে আমরা রে বাংলাদেশে ফাটাইছে তখন আরো কষ্ট বাচ্চেন লইয়া সমুদ্র সতেরো দিন সতেরো দিনে লাগছে চিটাঙ্গাই আমরা পৌঁছেছি তো সতেরো দিনের মাঝে খানের মধ্যে বাসি বাসি সতেরো দিন এক মন্দির আনাতো তো তা বিকাল লইলে আমরা সাধকিয়া বইয়া দেখতাম সূর্য ডুবা দেখতাম এনজয় করছি আবার কষ্ট লাগছে কিন্তু আসলে সব লগে একলগে থাকায় কষ্ট বুঝা গেছে না এনজয়টা বেশি লাগছে একলগে বইয়া গল্প জাহাজের ভিতরে কিন্তু সব তা আছে এত বড় জাহাজ আটতলা জাহাজ আছিল দেখো আজিন আমরা উপরে খুবই খুবই বালা সুন্দর আমার যুদ্ধ এর ফলে তো আইলাম ডাকাত আবার পরে আমরা কোন ফোনের কানেকশন নাই তো সিলেট যে আছে আমরা সুন্দরে আমরা কিছু করার নাই ঢাকার তিন দিন চার দিন ঢাকার পরে অফিস তো নেতারা কইছে আপনারা পনেরো দিন চার দিন বাড়ি যাও কা আমরা বাড়ি আপনাদের অফিসও জায়গা ওটা ঠিকঠাক করিয়া আপনাদের পোস্ট ঠিক করিয়া আর বার পনেরো দিনের দিন আইয়া অফিসও জয় নিবা তো আমরা গেছি বাড়ি তো বাড়িত গেছি সিলেট যাই আমরা খেয়ে গেছি নাইয়ার হোতাই গেছি আমরা যেন বাড়ির যাই আমরা রেখেও চিন্তা না আমরাও কেউ চিনতাম না বাড়ির গরো খেয়ে আসো কেন যাই না বাড়ির যাওয়ার হয়তো সবে খান না হাটি যে তোমরা বাসি আসো নি আমরাও ওখান দিয়া যে তুমি বাসি আসো নি ওরকম so Khala was just saying that um I, I, I've seen that Halim has um, uh, been typing into a text but into the chat box but that period of time she wasn't in Bangladesh for a, a lot of it in fact she, she started off being in East Pakistan um sorry in, in West Pakistan and then going over to Saudi Arabia um I think um Khala's um uh, uh husband worked as part of the Pakistani High, High Commission at, at the time um, um, and, but he was obviously of Bengali heritage and that was why, what was problematic about them and why they were kept indoors and kind of, you know, weren't allowed to listen to any of the radio programs at the time. So, so I'm going to ask Khala now about her uh, go, go, coming from Bangladesh now to, to London. So that, you know, her experience of, of the war was one that was mainly from outside of uh, Bangladesh. So Khala, do you have to say about your life? কিছু বুঝতাম পারছি না সুন্দর লন্ডন আইসি তবে লন্ডন তখন তো সেকেন্ড ওয়ার্ল্ড ওয়ার পরে কোনো ডেভেলপ হয়েছে না কিছু হয়েছে না লন্ডন আইয়া লাগে খুব বেশ আইসি একারে যেমন বাড়ি ঘর সবকিছু একটা অন্যরকম লাগছে ফিলিং ওখন যে লন্ডন লন্ডন আর তখন কুল লন্ডন সেভেন্টি ফোর লন্ডন একটা সেভেন্টি থ্রি সেভেন্টি টু তো আমার হাজবেন্ড আইসে আমি কয়েক মাস পরে আইসি আমার বাইক চিন্তা লইয়া সেভেন্টি থ্রি রে আইসি কিন্তু আইয়া হয়েছি আল্লাহ তো এটাই সৌদি আরব যে সুন্দর লাগছে মনে মনে তখন তারপরে যখন সেভেন্টি ফাইভ ও টাওয়ার হামলেট আইসি তখন তো ইটা মানে 
খোৱাৰ মতো এখন কৰি এখন আৰু এখন একটু আগেতো তিনিটা দেখাই গেছো মানে আই সি টাওয়ার হলে তাইও তো এখানে সবসময় দেখি আর আমরা যে কোন দেশ আইলাম কোন জায়গা আইলাম আমরা কোনো এখানে বেলু নাই কিছু নাই আমরা রে তারা মারে আমরা রে আমরা মানুষ তো হওয়ার জায়গা নাই অনেক প্রবলেম তারপরে আমরা এখান হওয়ার পরে তো বাকিটা তুমি স্কোয়াটিং একটা দেওয়া আছিল যে এখন মানুষের নিজেরা নিজের একটা টিং করছে যে আমরা তো একটা বাসস্থান করতে প্রথম তো সবে স্কোয়াটিং করা তো একটা জিও লাগছিল এই সময় যে যে ভাবছি উনি আমরা ও বাটন স্ট্রিট আমি আইসি আট নম্বর এখন পর্যন্ মনে হয় নেটওয়ার্কের প্রবলেম করে মাঝে মাঝে তোমার তা নষ্ট করে ঠিক আছে এখন আমি কুইকলি কই লাই ইংলিশে যে আপনি যখন কই গেছো সো এম কালো ওয়াজ জাস্ট সেইং দ্যাট শি আরাইভড ইন লন্ডন রিয়েলি সারপ্রাইজড এট দ্য স্টেট অফ লন্ডন হোয়েন শি আরাইভড ইট ওয়াজ কাইন্ড অফ পোস্ট ওয়ার এন্ড শি শি ওয়াজ লাইক ও মাই গড দিস ইজ লন্ডন বিকজ দিস ইজ নট হোয়াট আই ইমেজিনড ইট টু বি এম এন্ড এম সৌদি আরাবিয়া ওয়াজ অ্যাপারেন্টলি মাচ নাইসার সো শি ওয়াজ কাইন্ড অফ শি কোশ্চেন হোয়াট শিড ইমেজিন এন্ড হোয়াট শিড হার্ড অ্যাবাউট লন্ডন এন্ড দ্য রিয়েলিটি অফ ইট এন্ড দেন শি talks about that she originally started off in West London in Surrey as part of the Bangladesh High Commission the kind of place where she'd been stationed with that and then she talked about arriving into um Tower Hamlets in 1975 um and so um she arrived in 1975 and that there there was nowhere to stay for for her and her Bengali uh, her, her other Bengali families so khala afne afne khoi dai ble and sorry and she said that she arrived and she started squatting um just behind um the Royal London Hospital and she's actually still there she's still in that same property now um so she remains in the place that she squatted over 45 years ago taqala afne i'm just going to ask her about the, the 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 nature of the property and um kind of you know what what her experience was of that street because that became one of the big um kind of strongholds of the bengali housing action group so taqala afne um foi lai so afne khori da bla afne squatting khori ha mai so in um as goro ami tower hamle to o bara ke goro roishi emon ek jaga ta si amra god pai dorjar bara bari tam parina ubaye oi skin dara camera? বন্ধ করি লও সারা লন্ডন হসপিটাল তারপরে আমরা যাওয়ার পরে তো আমরা লাইট নাই গ্যাস নাই ইলেকট্রিক নাই আর একটা সাফার হয় একটার পর একটা সাফার সিক্স মান্থ আমরা রয়েছি লাইট ছাড়া গ্যাস নাই লাইট নাই পরে ঠেরি রে আব্বাস ভাইও না আমরা আব্বাস আসলা হেলাল আব্বাস তাই না আমরা রে খুব হেল্প করছো ঠেরি হেলাজ আব্বাস আরো আছেন আমরা রিনো বাক্কা তারা এখন অনেকজনের নামও ভুল ভরে গেছে গিয়া তো এখন উনা যা তো তারপরে আমরা হইস যে দেখি কি দেওয়া যায় তো টেরি টেরি আমরা এই এরিয়াত বাঙালি রে খুব হেল্প করছে সব রে আইসে হে আইয়া করছে কি তার রাস্তার ওটা লাইন আছে না নি ওটা তো কি 
গ্যাসের লাইন ইলেকট্রিকের লাইন আমরা টেম্পোরারি আনিয়া দিছে আনিয়া দিয়েও লাগেছে মনে হয় আরো একশো সাত মাস তারপরে আমরা চিন্তা করলাম যে আমরা দেখি প্রপার কোনটা আমি অতদিন সাহস করিয়া ইলেকট্রিক বোর্ড গ্যাস বোর্ড আসিল জহতপেটলানগিরির কোন অফিসও গেলাম গিয়া আমরা মাতিয়ে উঠিয়াতে তারা হইল আড়াইশো বন জমা দিলে এটা আমার সারা সপ্তাহ ও সারা গড়ে ওয়ারিং করলো ইয়া করিয়া এক বছর গেছে এক বছর পরে করিয়া দিয়া গ্যাস ইলেকট্রিক তো আমার গড়ো আমি হরাইছি আর সব ব্যবহার সাহস করে কেউ গেছে না ও আমরা গ্যাস ইলেকট্রিকের লাইন আনলাম হইলা আনার পরে কয়েকদিন পরে লন্ডন হসপিটালে তারা এটা প্রপার্টি রেট দিলাইল জিএলসি রে তো জিএলসি এর কাছে গেল কি তো আমরা জিএলসি রে আড়াই বন না তিন বন ওলা রেন দিতাম বুঝছো সপ্তাহ ওর মনে করে বললা দেড় ফোন তো আড়াই ফোন তারপরে সাড়ে তিন ফোন লাস্ট সাড়ে তিন ফোন রেন দিতে আমরা তারপরে জিএলসি এর লোক হলো আমরা দুই বছর তাকলাম তাহার পরে ও হাউজিং এসোসিয়েশনে এটা তো ডেভেলপ হওয়া শুরু হয়েছে লাই লাই ইম্প্রুভ হওয়ার সপ্তাহ তারপরে তো এখানে আমরা স্কুল হেটে লো হত ফাইট মাইট আগে তো এটা আমরা যেগুলো আইসি বেতলানগির তাত মানুষ আটটা উনা ডরাইয়া ওলা যাওয়া আসিল একটা তো জঙ্গল সাইড বিল্ডিং আমরা যাইতাম না আপনার <laughs> of Bengali families began to squat and she described that actually for the first six months of living in that property there was no electricity no gas and so they, they had paraffin heaters and candles and, and that's how they kind of got on with things um, and she described how Terry was one of the people who'd helped supporting um, the families and connecting them so I think they they literally kind of you know um, oh, what's the word that I'm looking for they they, they, they kind of made these kind of um, illicit connections onto the um, electricity cables and brought those into the houses so that they could have some um, <laughs> uh, uh, I'm just reading what's it seen one of the pop-up messages um, so um, he, so he assisted lots of those families to get electricity into the houses but that was obviously illegal and it was done outside of the system um, and um, uh, Khala talked about the fact that she she worked up the courage one day to go along to the actual kind of um, offices and uh, kind of negotiate saying look we're, pre we're prepared to pay and this was the point was that people were prepared to pay um, but one of the things that the council had done at the time was that they had instructed the electricity and the gas board not to supply spotted properties and that, that That wasn't uh, legal at the time and there was lots of discussion Tony Benn in Parliament was talking about kind of you know um, that, that, that that's not how you know people had squatter rights etc and so it, that shouldn't have happened but um, uh, the, the council would often dissuade the, the boards and the electricity and the gas board to connect off um, you know connecting those properties up but Khala went along and she went and um, uh, kind of uh, invited them to wire up her house they did and she paid for it and um, um, she, she got that started but Khala Afne, um, so I'm just going to ask her because she was just about to go on to talk about kind of um, other families uh, around her as well so Khala Afne I don't know if I'm going to talk to you I'm going to talk to you I'm আমরা <laughs> কিছু রাখতাম দরজার সামনে দরজা স্টেট খুলতাম না উপরে দিয়ে উন্ডো দিয়ে দেখতাম রাত্রে যদি এরা টাবল করতো উপরে দিয়ে উন্ডো তো নেও আমরা লুকাইয়া দুটোর তো লিখা মারতাম ওর আমরাও ফাইট করতি মানে যান বাসানি তো তখন ভর মানে পুরো একটা যুদ্ধর মাঝে আমরা মনে হয়েছে এরম করতে 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 এরা লয়ে ফাইট করা তো আমরা এই বেশি সকলে আমরা বহু চেষ্টা করি এইখান থেকে হরাইছি তারপরে সারা নিউ রোড ভরা আসিল জোর দোকানে জু হল তাহলে জু আর রেসিস আর আমরা বাঙালি জো সব বাঙালি লেটার ফ্যাক্টরি ফ্যাক্টরি আমরা বাঙালি হল আসিল আর জু হল ও আসিল আমরা 
আর তো বাঙালির এরিয়া কিছু না দোকান পাট না কিছু না আর আমি যখন আইসি তখন ইনো মানুষও বেশি আইসি না মানে তিন চার ঘর তারপরে আস্তে 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 আইতে আইতে তিরিশ ঘর হইছে মানে তা আস্তে আস্তে সব লাই লাই মানুষের সুযোগ বুঝতে পারছেন মানুষের এখন অন্য সেই খবর জানছেন রোন হসপিটাল করলে ওলা ওই বলা ওলা করে 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 আইসেন আর একটু ধৈর্য করে কষ্ট করছি অনেক করিয়া ধৈর্য সাথে রয়েছে ওরে এখন তো আমি রাজার আর এখন আমার ঘর মিলিয়ন ফান্ড ঘর আসলে অক্টোবর আমি এখন নিজেরে বুঝি যে যুদ্ধ ওর পরে ওই যে একটা হচ্ছে না দুঃখ ভরে সুখ আয় তো এখন একটা কষ্টও ফিল করি এখন Um, so Khala talked about the, the, the fact that they, they like, like Helene said, that there were you know, certain communities, the Jewish community and the Bengali community who lived around that area. And then she talked about, and she often said this in my interviews as well, that it was a time of great happiness and, and a struggle as well. Um, and it was a combination of both. Um, and that the racism in the area was something that united um, the, the communities, that they kind of all had to come together, they had to work hard, both themselves, individually, kind of, you know, uh, in terms of how they protect themselves and their families, in their homes, but also more widely as well. And Khala Afni, Arukah Hota, Amran Nani Jebla politics mati, baskochi mati, Shob Shomai Hali Huna Jaya Hali Beta Manushur Hota, Bule Beta Manush Horsoin Hota, Beta Manush Hota Horsoin. Arukah Beti Manush Hota Asla, Ki Afne, Afne, Afne Kita Mano Horoin, Beti Manush Kita Horsila. Ami Beti Manush Amra Jaya Horsi, Ami Amra, Amar Mera Asla, Tuk Boro Hoi Kesoin, Amra Kup Fight Horsi Raloi, Amra Kekheo Jodhi Akta Awaz Dito, Rastat Ki Chomra Loge Loge Danda Unda Loi Amra Obar Hoi, Amra Kunu Jo Horti Na, Amra Wani, সব সময় সবর আতে আত রাখছি মানে আমরা গরব হইছি না বরঞ্চ বেশি আমি আমি জানি আমি রাস্তাতে আমি আমার বাচ্চা না আমরা খুব বেশি রেসিজের প্রবলেম আমরা হামাইছি হামাইছি সাহস রাখছি সাহস রাখা এরপরে যখন আস্তে আস্তে মানুষ লাই লাই হলে একটা জিও অন্তর্ল আমরা ইকো হয়ে গেলাম আমরা ধরো এশিয়ান আমরা সব এশিয়ান যারাও আছে সব একটা জিনিস চিং করলো যে আমরা খালি মায়ের খাইতাম নি আমরা এখন মারিতলাম মো তারপরে আমরা যখন ছেলেরা আমরা ইয়াং জেনারেশন যখন লামলো যেন লেবার বাটি লেবার বাটি হইল লেবার আমরা বাঙালি অনেক হইল আমরা আসলাম নাম কিটা প্রথম কাউন্সিলার জালাল জালাল নুরুল হক আসলা নুরুল হক আসলা হেলাল আব্বাস তারপরে জালাল রয় আসলা জালাল রয় ফুরার নামটা আমার মাইন্ড এরা সহ তারপরে বিশেষ করিয়া ও আমার গর ফুরা নৌকা নয় ও গর বউ মিটিং হইত সবসময় অনেক মিটিং আমরা অনেক রহমন মিটিং করতাম ওখানে হইত আমি সহযোগিতা তারা বইলে তার সানাস্তা দেওয়া সব কিছু আমার হাজবেন্ড তো খুব মানে জু আসলা কি যে মানুষের লইয়া যে সব জিনিস আমরা সামনে থাকতে আমরা কোনোদিন ফিসে দিয়ে গেছি না আয়োজবধি মানে সাহস তো আমরা অনেক হইছে যুদ্ধ 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 জায়গায় জায়গায় আমরা যুদ্ধর মধ্যে আসলাম জায়গায় জায়গায় গিয়া বিগত করছি তখন তো একটা যুদ্ধ নাইনি বিগত করছি আটটা খাবার হরি উঠছে সমুদ্র সত্র দিন আওটে একটা যুদ্ধ সমুদ্রের ভিতরে বাসরাম ফুল কিনার কোন দিন ভাইবো একটা যুদ্ধ সবকিছুতে আমরা এরকম করি হরি এত সাহস আছে সাহস করে দিই না তারপরে আলতাবালি এই যে মার্ডার হইলো আলতাবালির মার্ডার হওয়ার পরে আলতাবালি পার কর লাগি মানে এখানে মিটিং মিছিল যা ওই তো সব তাত আমরা থাকতাম আমরা কোনোদিন কোনো জিনিস অফিসে দিকে ছিল না টাওয়ার আমলেট ডেভেলপ হোক যা হইছে বা বাদক বালা সব তাত আমরা সামনে থাকতে আমি আমার হাজবেন্ড আমার এমন কি আমার মেয়ে যাও আমার মেয়ের জামাই তো আনসারও তো আসেন তো আমরা মানে কোনো জিনিস করে দিকে ছি না আলহামদুলিল্লাহ আর আমরা ডেভেলপ করিয়া টাওয়ার হামলেট বিশ রাস্তা বানাইছি আজকে এখন প্রত্যেক দিন একটা না একটা এজেন্ট ওর একটা দোকান ওর একটা বাড়ি এরা ইয়া এখন মানে পিস রাস্তার মধ্যে খালি বই যা আমরা কিন্তু খুব কষ্ট করছি আমরা ফেকো বানি মেকো বরফের মাঝে বাড়াইছি বরফের রাস্তা তাটিছি তখন খুব বরফ আর এখন করছি এখন তো বরফ পড়ে না আমরা তখন আকি না বরফ করতো এত বরফ করতো আমরা বুঝছিন দিয়া শুনতে কিচ্ছু রে আমরা বয় করছি না আল্লাহ যা এত পালা জয় করছি আজকের এই জয় আমরার মেহনতের জয় Yeah. So, um, I, I can't do justice to what to what Hala just said then because she just said so much but she talked about the the courage that she had that she had to have and there was no choice that you know you had to uh, to, to fight and um and she talked about women's work and said that you know women were there we were always there and I think this is this came across in so many of the conversations that I had that women's work is not necessarily recognized but the meetings that were held in 
in her house, the, 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 the tea that was made, the conversations that were facilitated in her house, were, she was part of that. And um, she talked about her and her husband being at the front of so many of those kind of um, kind of uh, uh, activist organisations and, uh, and um, kind of meetings and um, demonstrations that happened much later. And so she talked there also about she named a few people. And actually, I didn't mention this in my in my talk. So at least three of the people who squatted, um, Nurul Haq, um, uh, Halal Abbas um, and uh, okay, and so other people went on to become counsellors, you know, so these people went from their squatter background to being squattering activists to then become involved in local politics. And so, you know, th this was something that um, kind of went on to become something where people didn't just stop with the squatting, it, it, it formed them as, uh, as uh, kind of individuals and formed the, the community. And I think Khala, um, uh, you know, said so much there, and she said it to, to me so many times, I've listened to Khala say this story so many times, and each time I'm always kind of uh, um, so much in awe of her courage and her kind of her, her passion and the fact that she she you know talks about that period it, 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 with great joy as well as with uh, kind of recognizing how much of a struggle it was. So, Kala, I've never asked you a question. I mean, I'm not questioning you answer, Jamie, but I've never asked you a question. I've never asked you a question. I've never asked you a question. I've never asked না তারপরে যখন আমরা আস্তে আস্তে ডেভেলপ শুরু হইল আমরা একটু সেটেল হইতে পারছি তখন কি আমরা এখানে কমিউনিটি সেন্টার করছি আমি তো অনেক কমিউনিটি ইনো সেন্টার লোকে সাহায্য করছি বহু বছর আমি আসতাম ইনো কমিউনিটি সেন্টার তো যেমন আমরা ল্যাঙ্গুয়েজ ক্লাস হয় ক্লাস ডাকো নারী অনেক কিছু সব কিছুতে আমি বলে আসলাম মানে আমরা এগুলার একটা ইয়ে করছি মানে নিজেরা নিজেরা আমরা একটু আমাদের আমরা আমার আর পিপুল লাগে যে একটা পালা আমরা ওটাও করছি ওটা অনেক ঘরে ঘরে গিয়ে আমরা মেয়েরারে আনতাম ল্যাঙ্গুয়েজ ক্লাসও আনতাম যে ওটা অনেক কিছু আমরা ভলেন্টারি করিয়া এখানে আমরা মানে আমরা খাওয়াজও করছি তার উপরে বাচ্চা স্কুলও দিয়া খাওয়াজও করছি আমি বা টুয়েলভ ইয়ার্স খাওয়াজও করছি কিন্তু সবটা মিলাইয়া একলগে রাখছি আমার একটা জিনিস খুব মনে আছে আমরা রাস্তার একজন যে সন্ধ্যা ভরে দিন লন্ডন সিটেল মাঝে তারা বাফার ছেলে আইরা স্কুল বাড়া থাকে এমন এটা করছে রেসি যে তারা ঠিক ভাগ পিছন যখন তখন লোক আমরা বাড়িছি রোড উঠ লইয়া পুলিশও ডাকছি আবার কি আমরা দৌড়াইয়া গিয়া যে সামনে গেছি তারা দৌড়িছে পুলিশ আইসে আমরা গাড়ির নিচে রোড রাখি দিছি পুলিশ আইয়া ফেরার এটা করে গেছে কি আমরা লোক আর কোনো মানে আমরা খুব জোহরি চলছিলাম যে লাওলা আলহামদুলিল্লাহ আমরা খুবই ভালা জোহরছি আর কি অনেক সাফা হয়েছে Again, Khala just talked about one particular incident, which, uh, you know, obviously, I think we're, uh, we're smiling about it now in terms of kind of the courage that Khala showed. But obviously, these are kind of horrific, traumatic events for these people. But she talked about this a man and his child being kind of attacked by racists and Khala seeing that from her window and then going outside, taking a stick and going outside, um, calling the police and going outside to kind of um, defend this, this person. And, um, and then sticking the rod out under a car when the police arrived because of Obviously, you didn't want to be caught um, with with a weapon in your hands uh, or a potential weapon. But I think this, this is uh, this is I think that what, one of the things that I think my research really will contribute to is the significance of what people like Khala and uh, Khala was one amongst many, and I could have invited so many people to come and speak with us today. But Khala was amongst one of many people who kind of really fought, not only for their squatted home, but for the wider community and were involved in that kind of anti-racist work that only really gets mentioned from Al-Tabali in 1978 onwards. But that work was being done, it was being done in the meetings that were ha happening in Khala's front room. I've sat in that front room and she said that, that this is where the meetings happened. And, um, you know, the, 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 yeah, exactly, I think um, I've just seen a comment pop up. We're often presented as a community that have been quite passive and conservative with a small C. And actually this, the, the, the erasure of our history, the erasure, the kind of absence of these voices is what has allowed people to think the Bengali community are this passive um, kind of um, submissive community out of all of the different kind of minority communities. And that's simply not the case. Um, and I think Khala's story, I mean, so thank you. Thank you. আমরা যে এই জিনিসগুলা তুলে এগুলো দরকার আমাদের প্রজন্মের জানা দরকার 
আমরা যে কিরম কষ্ট করছি যে করছি অনেক কষ্ট এগুলা তো সংক্ষেপে কিছু করছি এগুলা তো হওয়ার সময় তো খুব সংক্ষেপ হয়ে হওয়া যায় কিন্তু সময়ে যখন গেছে তখন খুব সময় একদিন আমরা রাত্রে নমাজ ভরি আর আমার বাইচ চিন্তা হলে শুভার যাইতেছি এমন ভাবে আমার উইন্ডোর মাঝে ফাত্তর দি ছোট ছোট ফাত্তর দিয়ে এমন ভাবে এটা মারছে আমরা সব ডরাইয়া বাচ্চা নার্ভাস হয়ে গেছেন যে কেউ লাগে শর্ট করা শুরু করছে মানে বুল্লি পড়ে আও তো আমরা সাফার করছি Hmm. I think, yeah, I think that the, the break of windows is something that I actually look, focus on in my in my research. So Khala was just talking about the fact that, um, you know, the, 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 the rocks and stones being thrown at windows was such a regular occurrence, but it didn't make any, any event, any incident less traumatic. And it was always really, really frightening for her and her children to have that happen um, in, in your home. So um, thank you, Khala. So I'm going to ask you, Halima, if you want to invite questions, we've got a little bit of time for some questions um so yeah yeah as shabna said if you'd like to ask the question please do post it into the chat box and sinjida and i are keeping an eye on the chat box or please do raise your hand and vocalize uh unmute yourself and vocalize your question um mahbub go for it hi Adima. um great session um and also thank you shabnam for 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 it as well um i I'm actually, i actually know some of your family members very well aisha zina your brother in law shaheen um, <laughs> well, somewhere um hafiz you know i'm very good friends with them know them for a very long time um great session i think just one thing i was just thinking as you, kind of the intrinsic link between 1971 and the liberation war i was speaking to you know an uncle or a dear friend as well um he was a um a school teacher in Sydney Green for probably 20 years plus and he came here to this country in 1973 um and one thing he was saying that um kind of the the link with the 1970 war a liberation war was that he said he did, did his degree beforehand and then there was a whole kind of hope of new country and new economy and the opportunities um but none, none of that happened and so then they came over he said and then i came over to this country in 1973 because there wasn't any employment opportunities or any life opportunities so as a result we moved to, to this country so i think so the, the, i think there's that kind of intrinsic link you know perhaps i don't know if you've explored or, or looked into it um but i'll I just speaking to me again happy to kind of pass on you on his contact details if you're interested in speaking to him um the other thing again i think you were mentioning about kind of that link of females and, and their activism in from 70s onwards and again i've seen so many kind of females playing a, a pivotal role in, including um and so you see like you know some of them going on to become counselors um there's um the the local mp apsana begum her, her, her dad was a, um was a counselor and i think that trend has continued with her like because i i know her quite well um i studied with her herself your brother in law shaheed together so um i've seen that kind of trend in her carrying on as a female activist thanks yeah thank you i th i think you're right about that um the lots of that mid 1970s migration was partly connected to what you've just described that kind of disappointment of of what happened in that kind of direct post war period and i think khala didn't didn't talk about it directly today but she she certainly talked about that there had been a a point in her family where they had talked about would they go back to bangladesh or would they stay here and they decided that actually the political situation had been so disappointing in terms of their kind of political allegiance and loyalties that they decided that actually they weren't going to go back home and they were going to stay and make home here instead and and so i think you're really right to say that there there were lots of different reasons and i think that's one of the things that i wanted to draw out in my research and it's really difficult in such a short session um that it's really important to to know that there are so many different experiences and that we you know i don't want to try and kind of um kind of uh, make one story from all of these different experiences of course there's broad themes that we can talk about but we are talking about uh, you know a big community of people from uh, mainly from silet but from other parts as well and who who had wildly different experiences and wildly different reasons for for why, why they ended up here and so it's important to recognize that diversity of experiences whilst also trying to kind of weave some kind of a story so that we can talk about it as well so i really appreciate that my hope so thank you any other questions is there anything coming through in the chat box uh said you just sorry i haven't been check any questions but there's an interesting comment perhaps shabna you'd like to expand um tanbu just was commenting that 
Um, I know that most young men, like my Boro Mama, which is the eldest maternal uncle, would get inspired by Bruce Lee films to take up martial arts to protect themselves from attacks. And perhaps this is also a parallel with different communities, certainly the um, sort of black community is highly involved in that as well. So I wonder if you could expand on that a bit perhaps. Yeah, well, I, I, I don't, I, I know of it. It didn't become a kind of something in, in my research, but certainly kind of um, through lots of social media connections that I was put in touch with, that became a really big thing. And that, that kind of, uh, it does appear in the British film is, uh, is in those documentaries. There are shots um, where um, it's in those kind of um, martial arts classes where people are training together. And it was that self-defense that you, if you couldn't rely on the police, if you couldn't rely on kind of the, the security being provided by kind of the, the police who are supposed to protect you, then you have to take that into your own hands. And again, it kind of, it, you know, these are things that don't necessarily get told and are again, um, things that don't, um, that, you know, there's a, 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 an idea about the Bengali community, again, being passive. There's this whole thing about kind of the effeminate Bengali male compared to kind of the, the aggressive black male and these kind of cultural colonial based tropes about what communities are like and what masculinity is like in these different racialized communities. Um, they were really important in how those communities were treated and kind of talked about. And I think you're right um, that the, 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 the kind of martial arts classes were really important way of the community and of young men gathering together and also feeling a sense of kind of solidarity in those sessions but also feeling that they were going to they they weren't going to rely on other people to protect them and they were going to look to themselves it didn't become a, a, a kind of a feature of my research but it definitely is something that I came across repeatedly from lots of different participants talking about that thank you um Paul what would you, would you like to unmute yourself yeah, hi, uh, thanks very much. Uh, that was fantastic uh, talk. I really uh, appreciated that. Learned a lot from that. Um, I, I, I just wondered, uh, it was part of a comment, a bit of a question. Um, I did my PhD on Camden Council housing. And um, one of the issues that came there was the way that uh, Camden Council in the, the 70s and 80s, because again, obviously there's a large uh, Bengali population in Camden. Mm. Um, Camden Council basically was... Uh, putting a lot of Bengali families into temporary accommodation. And there was a tragic fire in which the uh, Bengali family died in 1984. And interestingly, subsequent to that, uh, the, the, the Bengali population in Camden, they occupied the Camden Town Hall. And that was really, really a key moment in uh, Bengali mobilization in Camden. And then uh, there, was, there was much more inclusionary policies uh, in relationship to council housing for Bengali population. And I just wondered, um, because you know, I know I'm, I'm, you know, I'm very well aware of the uh, the the, you know, the squatting community in 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 Tower Hamlets, but I just wondered, um, do you know, was there any other squatting uh, by Bengali communities during the 1970s and 80s elsewhere in London, or was that or was that mainly, or was that solely in Tower Tower Hamlets and emerging out of the uh, out of the uh, you know the struggles there I just wondered if you knew yeah that's a really good question I, I'm afraid I don't know the answer to that I mean I, in, in all likelihood there were there were other Bengali families because I mean like I said in 1970s squatting was uh, you know such a widespread thing and uh, like you said there was a big Bengali community in Camden um, uh, going into the 1980s but in the 1970s as well and I know that my dad for example um, uh, he was a resident in uh, Camden in the 1960s when he first arrived and actually just you talking about the uh, fire there he he described to me so this it goes back to the kind of conditions that the migrant men were living in um, before the families arrived and it was those kind of very you know lots of people crowded into um, kind of flats and houses and he, he, he lives in a place where um, just off Tottenham Court Road where he um, shared with lots of people and there was a fire and he escaped but two people who had arrived just before um, just a couple of weeks before tragically lost their lives they, uh, they 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 jumped from that flat in order to try and escape the fire and they they, they died um in in trying to kind of escape the fire so uh, and they passed away but those are the kind of horrific conditions that people are living in and and uh, i'm sorry paul i don't i don't really answer your question but yes it, in all likelihood i think there probably would have been other kind of uh bengali families squatting in other areas because there were squatters 
in, in many London boroughs outside of Tower Hamlets as well. But this was the concentration and the Bengali Housing Action Group that I've kind of focused on were very much connected to this Spitalfields and Whitechapel area. And that was the kind of network that I focused on. Um, but yeah, thank you for highlighting again the, 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 that some of those conditions that my dad described in the 1960s were still happening in the 1980s, like you said. Um, uh, and actually, uh, COVID has revealed that we've got lots of our communities still living in conditions that are that shouldn't be tolerated in 2021. So, um, uh, yeah. Um, just to follow on from that, few comments in the chat box. Um, Georgie mentions that Abdul Momin sadly passed away in January 2020. Yeah who's involved in the Camden Town Hall takeover following the fatal fire in the bed and breakfast hotel. People from Tower Hamlets took food and support and stayed over. Yeah, yeah. Um, also, uh, Ahmed Al-Bhai mentions there was a quite a large number of Bengalis were housed near Shepherd's Bush um, in the early 80s and invited some friends made at Bangladesh Center. Okay. Um, there's a question from Charlotte Panel. Um, do you think these experiences impacted politics in Bangladesh? That's an interesting question. See, I think that one of the dynamics of the whole London-y relationship is that, and it comes back to what um, Hosna Khala said at the beginning, that you know it was not what she imagined when she arrived here, because I think there's a story about London that we tell back home. And I know that certainly when I, because I've got a kind of Facebook group that I uh, use to try and advertise and recruit participants for my research. And uh, some of those Facebook uh, members became, became, uh, were from Bangladesh and they were shocked. There were lots of comments like, oh, what do you mean? You went to London and then you squatted. What, what, what's that about? You, you know, that's not what we heard about London. Um, and I think part of that story, that the london narrative means that we often didn't share what we were going through here, um, partly because we didn't want to, uh, you know, so certainly I, from my perspective, I don't, I don't think my dada daddy, my nana nani, I think that, that my parents wouldn't have shared the struggles that they faced because it would have made them worried. Um, but there was also something of the kind of the london story, the london kind of imagination was that we were all living these lovely lives, kind of, you know, and visiting the Queen, uh, Queen's Palace and kind of um, making lots of money and that, and, and, that kind of the the reality and kind of the the disconnect between the reality isn't something I think that necessarily got widely shared with back home and I think yeah I think that um, someone's just commented that that myth of London still uh, persists and it absolutely does um, uh, uh, and it's part of that kind of problematic kind of dynamic between between um, Britain and Bangladesh the the realities uh, are, are, are vastly different. Um, perhaps we might need to um, close up just, but I just wanted to let you know that um, Abdul Qadir's daughter is here, Jinna Begum. Um, oh, and yeah. she's been sort of commenting throughout, filling in some of the gaps. So thank you for attending today. Yeah, yeah, thank you, Jana, and uh, thank you to her entire family because they've all been really um, kind of important to my research, and certainly the stories that um, her father and her mother and her her older sister shared with me have been critical to the development of the kind of ideas that I that are in my the thesis that I'm still in the kind of painfully writing. But, um, but yeah, I was just going to say actually, I don't know. Um, uh, I was just wish, can I share my screen quickly? Is. Yeah, so I was just going to, um, oh, not that one, okay, just going to say that as in terms of kind of the research output, sorry, I will just get to the slide and then I'll share it properly. So as one of the research outputs, um, I um, have been involved in making a short film and um, so there you can see Terry Fitzpatrick and um, Khosrow Sasa who um, were reunited as part of this film after kind of some uh, some decades apart and so there will be eventually a point at which I, I can see that some of the chat in the chat box is about kind of you know the importance of sharing this history and so uh, this event is kind of you know a token gesture towards that but hopefully the the oral histories that I've collected will definitely stay with um, uh, the the um, Tower Hamlet's local history library and archives. So those interviews and those voices will be recorded and there for the future generation. And this film is hopefully a way of capturing some of the kind of stories that that um, I was able to kind of hear and um, to obtain through my research. So the film, the whole, will um, hopefully be ready in autumn sometime. So um, that will be something else for people to look out for. Um, but yeah, so that, that's just.
Thank you so much.